Hello, everyone. We're so glad to have you with us. My name is Claire Lebeau. I'm the Chief Advancement Officer for NASEF, the Network of Academic and Scholastic Esports Federations. That is a mouthful, so from now on, I'm just going to say NASEF. Um, thrilled to be hosting this LinkedIn Live session for members of the Esports Trade Association. Um, a lot. I, the thing I love about this trade association is we have people from all different aspects of the esports community, industry, education, gamers, streamers, casters, the whole nine yards. And so today we're going to share with you what it is like to be in the scholastic esports space and how we are connecting what's happening in the schools to what's happening in the rest of the esports world. So with that, we're going to do a quick round robin among the guests so you know who you're talking to. And we've also said if you're joining us live, type in the chat who you are and where you're from. So we, we know all of that. But let's go ahead and get started. Lori, do you want to tell us a little bit about yourself and where you're from? Yes, my name is Lori Lehman, and I'm from Albuquerque Public Schools in New Mexico. We started our esports program about six years ago with the goal of sustainable growth. The best thing that happened to us was meeting Claire and Gerald from NASEF, and we immediately formed our own affiliate, which helped us in amazing ways. Uh, we started small with less than 100 students and a handful of high schools. Now we're in elementary, middle, K-8 and high schools uh, and have over 1,000 students. We got to adopt Scholastic Esports a couple of years ago, and things have just gotten better and better. I'm happy to be here, and I love to talk about esports. Awesome. Great. Uh, Peter, how about you? Where are you from? And tell us your story a bit. Peter Whitmore. I work in wonderful Moreno Valley Unified School District in sunny Southern California. Um, I am a coordinator in the Technology Innovation and Assessment Department. And I support many departments, including secondary ed, college and career, and elementary ed for various things. And my favorite thing to support is Scholastic Esports. We've had our um, program for two and a half years now. Um, our district is made up of 32-ish thousand students, 82% um, of whom are free and reduced lunch. Uh, for some more demographics, about 70 2% Hispanic, 12% African American, and the rest is kind of a mixture. Um, we now have esports programs at 34 of our 36 schools. We just have two more elementaries that need to find coaches so we can release their equipment to them. Um, but we have esports programs at um, uh, 21, 20 of 22 elementaries, all seven middles. Uh, four traditional high schools and three alternative uh, ed high schools, including our um, special ed, very at-risk population school. They have a program and they compete in our league. Um, so really super psyched to be here. And thanks for having me. I'm excited to, uh, to be with these wonderful people. Perfect. Thank you. Julius. Before we went live, we were all commenting on your awesome background there. Um, so tell us a little bit about your program, including how you came to have that fantastic logo. Well, uh, how you doing? I am Julius Edwards. I am the esports director here down at Palm Beach County uh, at, at Palm Beach Lakes High School, Community High School. I um, also am the VP for the Sunshine State Esports League, the affiliate for NACIF. Uh, you know, uh, our program started right around 2019 um, through uh, some Pew funding um, to see if esports and scholastic esports would give disengaging students uh, a chance to thrive in the education system. And uh, we saw tremendous re uh, results from that. We started off with 10 kids within the program at our school, and now we're close to 420 kids right now going through the program. Um, the, the logo on the back, uh, we are very student-led. Um, our students really do run the club. Um, when, when you uh, look at it, we have our, our officers and we have our goals. We run it like a business. So we have a design team who actually designs everything that we do, uh, all our uh, all our merch, all our designs, all our logos, anything that you see that represents Palm Beach Lakes, that is student-led. So um, anytime you see me on and you see something that has Palm Beach Lakes on, just know a student made it. That's very cool. I love that. 
Um, so everyone has used this phrase, scholastic esports, and we just heard Julius refer to having a club, not just a competitive team. So let's just take a second and talk about that. What is scholastic esports um, and how is that implemented? And I'm just going to throw this out. So whoever wants to jump on it first, go for it. I'm going to jump in because I say scholastic esports is the beautiful integration of competitive esports and education and how could you not go wrong i mean that that's the way to go our students have gained so much from that just recently i was talking to um, a couple of our students who are about to graduate one is going to major in cybersecurity. i mean these are careers that are so related to what they've been doing the past couple of years so it's just um it's uh it's a game changer absolutely peter what's scholastic esports to you how's that different from just you know competing teams so I think what we've done uh, with Scholastic Esports is we found basically the keys to the kingdom when it comes to student engagement in our classrooms. Now, what we uh, did and what a lot of districts do around the world is start with at the club level. So getting kids to stay after school can be a tall feat, uh, but with video games, shoot, it becomes a lot easier. And then once you have a nice club um, situation at your school, you have a built-in audience for actual classes within your uh, school system. So we actually have several cl esports classes in our district. Uh, we have intro to esports at the middle school level, which is taken directly from NACEF's wonderful curriculum set. Um, a colleague and I took that class and fleshed it out for the high school level. So we, we wanted a, a place for our uh, middle school kids to land at the high school. So we have intro to esports at the high school level also that goes even deeper into the, um, the diagram that you see behind Claire. Um, we call that the tattoo in our district because we refer to it so often, we might as well just have it on our arms. Um, but they're actually, at the end of that course, they're producing um, actual school-wide and in some cases district-wide tournaments. So yeah, gaming is at the center of it for sure. But someone's got to build the website. Somebody's got to do the marketing. Someone has to be liaisons for for dignitaries who come in the door to show them where the where to go and also tell them when the, the tours of the esports facilities are going to take place. Um, someone's got to do the streaming and the shoutcasting. So um, kids who are not gaming are still heavily involved in scholastic esports. In fact. Our middle school, one of our middle school programs now runs our district events for middle school. Um, wow. By that, I mean they are doing all the league management. They're doing all of the end of uh, end of uh, season tournaments. We, we have three in-season tournaments. Kids are doing it all now. Same thing at the high school level. We have kids who are running that um, for the district. And so they're learning how all of these things that are right behind Claire, they're doing it in real time and it matters because there's a trophy ceremony. They pass out the trophies. They do all the hosting. So they're seeing what it is to live in the real world and, and see, uh, draw a direct connection from their efforts. Like the, the reciprocal benefit is completely there. Uh, they see it in real time. And uh, talk about Scholastics. One of our gals, who's not a heavy gamer, but she's in our uh, high school one of our high school's programs, she does all the streaming um, and uh, arena management and so forth for our high school league. She did it at our in-person all-girls league Mario Kart tournament that we held at the University of Redlands. And the director of esports at the University of Redlands saw that, was blown away, and offered her a full scholarship to attend his university. That's it. I'm telling you, we found the keys to the kingdom, everybody. It's just a matter of starting uh, your program and growing it. And um, it's so exciting. I need to stop talking because I'll go for two hours. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Well, you know what? That's a nice thing when we're all so excited about what we're doing and the impact that it has on the students. We're all absolutely, I always say like, you got to kick me off my soapbox because yep. I am on it in a heartbeat because I often say I lead with my heart and I see the profound impact on so many students when they join an esports club and they find their connection at school and their people. And the thing I love is it doesn't matter if they're technically minded, if they're creatively minded. The beauty of esports is there's a place for everyone to connect and to be valued and to have their skill set elevated. And when you're in, I mean, for all of us, regardless of the age, that's fantastic. But when you're in middle school or high school, 
that's transformational. And I love that about esports. Um, so, Julia, we've talked a lot about this already, but do you have anything to add? How is esports much more than just playing games at school, scholastic esports? Well, the biggest thing is, you know, you, you want to ask your students, um, what 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 do they define esports as? And um, I remember when we first sat down and I asked my officers and my students, say, well, what do you think esports is? And I think the definition that we came up with says, esports is an avenue within education landscape that merges captive ramming of video game industries with project-based learning and educational objectives. So when you look at it, you capitalize on the interests of the STEM subjects, including gamification, digital media, robotics, and financial literacy, directing them towards a structured and educational setting. So when you look at it and you look at Scholastic Esports, you take all of these subjects that students look at and want to evolve themselves in. Now, you may not have pure gamers because some people just don't game, but they love to broadcast. Some people just may want to deal with financial literacy and learn how to budget, learn how to create, and learn how to manage. So we have a whole team strictly just for that. So when you look at Scholastic Esports, it's bringing in different subjects and different type of students into one perfect area where they allow themselves to thrive as a community. And I think, you know, most people, when they say, when you when they hear the word esports, they immediately go to the game, but they forget the ecosystem shows them that there's different ways and avenues that you can kind of go into. So I think when you talk about scholastic esports, you got to look at the whole entire circle of students that you're gathering into this one specific uh, uh, space. So I think the biggest thing is um, when people look at Scholastic Esports as a whole. And I always go back to when I, you know, I was a sports coach, I was able to coach for 19 years. You're looking at different students connecting when that when that space is normally not there, you know, and you get those kids that normally are not engaged, now engaged with students that are kind of like, would you say the popular students at the, at the school? You know, you got to start a football team now you have the star of the uh, 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 Rocket League team. And these two may never have connected without Scholastic Esports. And now you're seeing different things change within the atmosphere of the school because of Scholastics. Mm -hmm. Lori, I see you nodding oh, vigorously yeah. to that. Have you had a similar experience? Absolutely. Well, I, I think it was uh, Jake Voss of uh, Washington State who said, anytime a student joins esports, a friend is made. And that is so true. And um, um, the other statement that I remember was Todd Harris from Skillshot. He said on LinkedIn that um, any career, any tech related career that a student goes into, that's a win for esports. And it is whether the kids choose to just not join the team, but do it in some other way, like Julius and Peter both said. It's amazing. It does so many things for the kids. We have students in our clubs who do just like you're talking about. They um, One student might be designing the jackets or the jerseys. Another student might be doing the shout casting or the broadcasting. They all have their role, and it does amazing things for them. Um, I have had the fortunate experience of collecting quotes from students who are involved in our scholarship program. And I find things that warm my heart so much from, uh, I just saw one today from a student who said, um, it helped me not be gang affiliated anymore. I have another kid who said I'm autistic and I never had friends and all of a sudden I have friends and I never belonged to a club or a team ever in my whole educational life. So these are the game changing things that I think are amazing for kids. Right, right. And as I said, I think those, you know, it makes a difference that year for those students, but it really changes their self-confidence and how, you know, how they view others. And so that's going to, that puts them on a different foundation. I mean, literally forever, literally forever. It's amazing. Um, so we've been talking a lot about all these different roles that students can have. And I've got this in my background. Let me lean the right direction. Um, but this is NACEFs. We do joke about all of us at NACEF. Are we going to get this tattooed or something someday? Because we talk about it so often. 
Um, but the idea is that players and games are at the center and the esports and the video gaming is the magnet that draws students in. And on the career side of impact, they have an opportunity to try out and explore all these different careers. Now, something that I've observed, I've been with NASAF from day one when we were a pilot program in Orange County, California, with 25 schools. So imagine now the growth in what is it now, just about six years from then to now, when we have you know thousands of schools represented just on this call, um, thousands of students. But if you look at this, not only are these careers that can be pursued in the esports industry, they also are connections to careers outside of the esports industry. Now, six years ago, we used to talk about this as being, as, that was the main way it worked. Kids would find their place in esports, and then we thought, well, they'll be able to apply that in some other industry. Well, guess what? Esports is on this massive hockey stick of growth. And so, developing skills in esports, they will likely also be able to apply those in esports as they graduate. And, you know, I'm a parent. I always tell my kids, be in a job you love. And what's better than connecting your passions to the job that you have? We've all been able to do that. And so that's something that's really exciting for these students. Um, so what kinds of things do you do in your different programs to prepare students for careers in the esports world? Peter, why don't you go ahead and tackle that one first? Yeah, so um, when my colleagues and I, Josh Combs um, and Jessica Roque, when we started this program, it was um, it was basically an I do. In other words, we had we we're on the I do part of the I do, we do, you do model. So at, we did in person tournaments, and we did all of the modeling for these uh, in person leagues. And how do you conduct yourself? Oh, we don't listen to how we talk to each other professionally. And we did all these things in front of the coaches and the students to model proper professional behavior. And then we started to weave the coaches and students into our production. So yeah, we would plan it all, and but we would give them the job. So, um, and we would make sure they knew how to, again, conduct themselves. And this is a different level than when you're gaming at home. You have to remember there are superintendents here and 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 vendors and dignitaries. You have to con so there's the soft skills piece um, uh, that we are really trying to impart on everyone involved. And so we started to pass the baton even more. So again, as I mentioned earlier, it's to the point where it's a complete you do. Josh and I and Jessica, we sit back and we work on other things now that we're able to grow the program in different ways, like focusing on uh, college and career pathways, which I'll discuss, I'm sure, at some other point on this call, but because the kids took over that stuff they're supposed to take over. So that's the whole point of the diagram, is, and it's really happening. Um, so we have kids who are doing the fandom and art and media for our events. We have kids who are developing software in our high school classes. They're using Unreal Engine um, and other things. They're we have kids that we bus to our events in addition to the players who are uh, in the championship because they're one of the coaches on the team. Wow. They're analyzing uh, they're analyzing the different pieces and they're actually having uh, VOD reviews and and all the uh, oh we even have a school um, one of our alternative high schools March Mountain High School they said hey Pete we our kids aren't really into competing this year it's just not their thing but they're super into planning stuff I'm like. Good to know, because uh, when our um, local library reached out to Josh and me and said, hey, can you guys help us plan X, Y, and Z? I said, no, we can't. March Mountain High School kids can. Connected those two. We have after school, um, we have kids from our, our, our one of our alternative high schools. Remember, these are second and, third, second and third strike students who are volunteering to go to the local library, not during school, I'm talking about evenings, to plan community events with the library. And now they're on a cadence with the local library. Um, so what happens, I think it's once a month, uh, they, they do the advertising for the community. And now Moreno Valley has this outside of school, um, uh, very positive gaming community at our local library brought to you by alternative ed high school students. I mean, if the proofs in that pudding <laughs> that, you know, these these kids are learning the skills they need to produce and be happy and 
and interact with one another um, and make the world a better place. That's fantastic. I love all those connections. And it takes being heads up about that too, because you connected those students who were looking for a place to be productive and to be part of the system. And they didn't see it immediately, but kudos to you, Peter, for recognizing a great place for them to develop those skills and develop that leadership. Um, what else, Lori, how do you help students develop skills for the professional world and the career world through your esports programs? Well, I think that I'm really impressed by all the things that, that you both, you and, and um, uh, Julius and Peter have said, because you're doing just all the right things. It's wonderful. So we've started a little slower. And um, one of our great teachers, uh, Marta Anderson, who is also a member of NACEF and a fellow, uh, she starts off off very, very simply, and she gets the kids where some of them are not used to even speaking to other people or speaking to a group. And she starts very slow with them, learning how to speak, learning how to interview, learning how to do things like that. Then she has other ones who have a sense of writing ability, uh, get going on building a website, doing things like that. So we even have one of our amazing teachers, uh, Miles, Dr. Miles Harvey, who um, takes uh, an esports a game and has the students analyze it as literature. And all of a sudden they're interested. It's like, oh, this is a great book. I can analyze this. I know all about it. So there's a lot of different approaches. They all work. Going over to uh, talk about the events, um, we've been, we took our, we consider our higher colleges in New Mexico our pipeline schools. So we have them come to our events and help train our students in how to put the event on. And they get involved in all aspects. We have a ways to go, but it started and we're going to continue that. I think that's a really important thing. And I'm so happy to hear how everyone's doing this. What are you doing, Julius? Well, uh, we have a program during the day as well. Um, Last year, about two years ago, the Pew Foundation, who originally gave us our original grant, um, saw what happened, saw how good that this uh, this club was uh, growing, and they put money towards a uh, in-school. They actually put uh, close to a uh, half a million dollars uh, to for the infrastructure of the in-school program. Um, last year alone, um, we started off with just uh, the regular standards through digital media. Um, and as we grew, we changed those standards, uh, you know, slightly as far as assignments goes to fit the need of what the kids learn through esports. Um, you know, you know, case in point, the design you see behind us that wasn't created by me, that was created by a student. So a lot of the things we do during the day segue into the club in the afternoon. So during the day, as we teach them the skills during the day and the afternoon, they then now take that one specific skill, whatever that skill that, you know, that they really want to grow in, we allow them to do it in the club in the afternoon. So, uh, you know, in the afternoon, like our shoutcasters and broadcasters, they strictly deal with all our media streaming, things of that nature. We have a team, what we call the project, uh, the project team. They do all our setups. During the class day, they do all our setups during the class day. So if we need something, you know, change, a computer move, those students in that room does that. Um, so those skills they learn during the day is actually um, amazing because in the afternoon, now they have a chance to work with their actual team. So they get a chance to work with teams that, you know, just like in the real world, hey, you know, you have a job to do, make sure you go ahead and do that. Um, they also have a chance to also get five certifications if they go through the four-year program um, through the digital media pathway and also through financial literacy. So they also, when they leave now, they also get to have those certifications um, to actually go into the real world and get a job post-graduation um, if they do not want to uh, pursue, uh, uh, you know, the college, you know, the college world. So those are the things that we kind of teach our kids during the day. So in the afternoon, they already have the knowledge. So now they're getting those valuable hours to say, you know, on their resume, hey, the last three years I've been doing this. And they're very knowledgeable in doing that. So now, even through with the Sunshine State Esports League, they're now starting to actually set up things with the Sunshine State Esports League, starting little tournaments and things like that within the district. Um, so those things are, are, are now we're starting to see and see that flourish through multiple organizations like uh, the Education Foundation, 
um, who actually put money also into building a podcast room to increase female participation. So those type of things now, those students are now starting to see. So now when they get into the real world, they can say, hey, I have four years of doing setups for a podcast. I have four, I, you know, we got a sound engineer and all she does is do the sound for all our streaming. So, you know, those big things are, are huge, huge, um, you know, uh, within the Scholastic Esports round. Yeah. Julius, Jordan was asking what kind of certifications are your students getting? Our certification students, they're getting Photoshop Illustrator. Um, they also get a Premiere Pro After Effects. Um, uh, they're also getting one certification in financial literacy. And just last night, we we, we actually, through FPNL, started a drone team through our esports and you know our students now have a uh possibility to get another uh another certification through project management project management through that uh same uh through that same realm so uh in any case they'll probably love if they do it right they should have six certifications through that that's fantastic and i think you know today it's so important to have demonstration of what you know when I was growing up, you only needed a portfolio if you were trying to be, you know, like chief marketing officer at a company or something. And now to get into college, these students need these impressive portfolios and resumes and everything. It's so competitive. And one thing I love about all these esports programs is whether it's the certifications or the practical experience, if they built a website, if they're running social media, if they're shoutcasting, if they're streaming, those are all things that are public and that can be recorded and captured and then used for applications for college or for jobs. So it's very applicable what they're doing in these programs to help them as they go down their pathway for their career, whatever that might be. Um, so Esports Trade Association, as I mentioned at the beginning, this is a combination of folks that are in industry and folks that are in education. What kind of partnerships do you have with industry or with local businesses in your community that's helping you with this esports program that you manage? Lori, go for it. Yeah, I'd love to. So uh, my first affiliation started by accident. I had a call from a young woman who said she was interested in um, being an esports coach. And I said, great. So we gave her an interview. We talked with her. And I said, let's um, find a school for you. Well, before we could find a school for her, she took a job with a company by the name of XT. And we stayed in touch. And over the years, finally, at one point, I came to her and I said, um, We've been together. You've been really a wonderful partner for a couple of years. Um, uh, would it be okay to ask you for some funding? I asked her for a pretty decent amount. And she said, no, we can't give you that. We can give you this. And it was four times that amount. I was just like, oh, my God. <laughs> oh, so, what a great problem. <laughs> it was wonderful. But uh, we also... Um, for instance, our New Mexico Activities Association, they're a great partner. And um, we worked with um, Spectrum and got some desks at a very good price and uh, split the cost. And we're storing them for them and they can use them in their, their once a year uh, championship event. We can use them for all our events. So we've kind of worked out whatever kind of deal we could. One time, another accidental thing, a secretary to the superintendent got an email and thought it was a scam and sent it to me. And what it was, was a company that liked to give money to either military or education when they built a new uh, travel center. So I got on it right away and sent all the information and got that amount too. So you just have to see whatever comes up, grab it as quick as you can and go. We've got partnerships with um, uh, Pepsi who gives us stuff for every event. Um, our pizza in town, Dion's Pizza. Um, lots of Riverside Technologies has been a great partner. They uh, help us out by giving us better prices on jerseys. We put Xfinity on one sleeve and Riverside Technologies on another. And we're willing to do many more. That's fantastic. At, when you're in education, you definitely need a pizza partner. That is that is probably number one on everyone's list, right? Uh, Peter, what kind of partnerships do you have in your community? Uh, my favorite one is, is probably the local chapter of the uh, Optimist Club which they're universal. So anybody on this call, you just got to Google Optimus Club near me. And the reason I uh, love them so much is 
first of all, I had never heard of them. And I just got introduced to them because our school district um, is partners with them on certain endeavors. Um, and so when I looked into them, their mission and vision is completely aligned with what we're the folks on this call and what we think about kids. And basically it's people who get together and they just think of ways to make kids' lives more positive. That's it. And so when I shared with them what we were thinking, this was years, three years ago, about how we wanted to grow this program for that very purpose, to make kids' lives better, um, they jumped on and they said, okay, how can we help? And so they sponsored um, two giant trophies that go past your, your belt. I oh, remember those they're trophies. Gorgeous. They're gorgeous. They're gorgeous. So we use them as traveling cups. We have one for, now we have one for, we have another sponsor who did the third, but we have one for elementary, middle, and high school. And those are what travel after each of those in-person uh, tournaments per season that I mentioned earlier when those occur. They get to take them home, and that's a thing. Like, we've created a thing in our district, um, uh, you know, with these healthy rivalries, and the Optimist Club really helped with that. And they're expensive trophies. If you have not bought them, you'll see. And these that are that tall are astronomical. So we um, we we have the Optimist logo on there, and so and we talk them up whenever we can because they're wonderful. Um, we've also partnered with um, vendors with whom we do business anyway. Um, I am fortunate enough to be not only in the technology department physically, but I work with someone who is in the technology department, um, Josh, who does a lot of the partnering with the vendors for our district. And so when they find out that we um, are, you know, uh, uh, into esports as much as we are, they're like, well, tell us a little bit more about it, or they already know about it. And so they are more than happy to uh, donate banners and shirts and sometimes uh, funding for uh, food at events um, or technology for prizes. Like we've given away Chromebooks and backpacks and all sorts of things. So Converge One is a big one. Dell we've used. Um, I'm trying to think. Uh, there's other others that come to mind, uh, but anyway, it, they are around you. It's just a matter of asking good questions in your district the, and or LEA with whatever type of organization you work for, because there are people who say, oh, yeah, we work with so-and-so. I can put you in touch. There's all kinds of experts that are right around uh, your phone and or a walking distance in your school district. You'll find them. They want to help. Right. Absolutely. And those I saw someone put in the comments, yeah, the traveling trophies are great. Um, the jerseys are great. Something that I have found in talking with lots of different schools, and this is a free item announcing the esports program on the announcements. That legitimacy that we keep talking about, it means so much to these students. And when you put the esports team on par with the basketball or the football or, you know, whatever the competing teams are, that's really important. So, uh, but yeah, those trophies you have are beautiful. I remember the first time I saw those, oh, whoa. I wish I had something like that around when I was in school. Julius, what kind of partnerships do you have in your region? In our region, um, one of our biggest supporters, uh, number one was the Pew Foundation, which are the Pew Foundation of Palm Beach County. Um, they were the first one to initially start the program. Um, but our biggest supporter is the uh, one of one of the biggest supporters in our uh, in our county is uh, the Education Foundation of Palm Beach County. Um, you know, they have been tremendous in helping us grow as a unit um like i said before uh they initially started our streaming uh, our streaming room um by purchasing some of the stuff in there the cameras the back lights and things of that nature and then also this year they actually outfitted the whole podcast room um they brought the mics they brought the boom sticks they, they did all of that and they're very huge uh in palm beach county as far as helping our uh, teachers get supplies and students to get what they need um so when you look at those type of foundations and 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 what they do the impact they have on other students um you know it's huge not only for us but also for the whole foundation of the county um because i'm not the only one benefiting from this one foundation um and we also got local partners like the palm Beach county sheriff department we got, uh, uh, they actually help us out with a couple of things. We have a couple other people, uh, especially universities that we we uh, 
that we partnered up with Full Sail University. We have a partnership. We have a huge partnership with Full Sail University. We got a partnership with uh, Kaiser University. Um, some of the local businesses around. And the biggest thing is our parent committee is huge. Um, when you look at you talk about partnerships, you know, when, when you, and you talk about parents and what they can do for you. Uh, it's all about who you know, you know, and when you speak it, and it's once you say, hey, we need this, those parents then go out to their companies and their foundations and say, hey, this company decided, hey, they want to help you out maybe with some t-shirts, or maybe they want to help you out with some hats or things of that nature. Hey, you got to have it a banker. We had a local uh, restaurant, uh, Jamaican restaurant, who, who outfitted our whole entire banquet with food. So, you know, when you have those things, that helps you out and keeps the cost down, you can now give more back to the students. So, when you, you know, it's, it's all about action, um, you know, and most businesses in your county want to help. They just don't, you just got to bridge the gap, you know, between that. Hey, you know, hey, I need, you know, such and such for this, or we're running a big tournament. Can you donate pizzas? Like Peter said, those things go a long way because if, if they're not donating, you're paying. And that hurts the students because the more you can give to the students to succeed, the more you can help out, you know, on the, on the back end of them. And I see, especially, like I said, when it comes to uh, the Education Foundation, they are such a big supporter of us. And also, and not to mention, you know, MSI, some of these bigger companies, MSI, Acer, those type of companies, they also send Logitech, send stuff for prizes. So you just got to really reach out and just say, hey, listen, this is what we're doing. This is what we're, you know, what we plan on doing. And they're willing to help you grow your program. Absolutely. So one thing that I want to make sure that people watching this take away is the brainstorm that is happening here, just from hearing each person share their experience. And I love about the esports world and the scholastic esports world that we are all so open to freely sharing our information and our resources and our ideas. Um, you know, the the Discord community, the NASA Fellows community. I mean, those are all great places. And of course, Esports Trade Association. So that no matter where you fit into this picture, you can find other people. I mean, it's a new industry, but it has been around for a while. And a lot of us have yeah, a lot of us have tried, yeah, a lot of us have tried things and succeeded or failed or may have a different take on something. So I mean there's there's great benefit in connecting with this community and learning from each other. Um, so Peter, you had mentioned earlier, and I can't remember the exact statistic, but a large percentage of free and reduced lunch of um, Hispanic students, of other populations in your district. How do, how do you address issues of equity within esports? So uh, first thing we wanna do is get kids to school. Um, because they can't obviously learn unless if they're at home. And so we found that um, students getting kids to school via esports has been one positive way to start to address equity. And one of the things we did, uh, so I can talk about that, those the data piece later on, but um, one of the things we did when we built our charter is, let me move this over here so I'm looking at you. There we go is one of our values was equity when we started building our program. We started with something very dry, which was equipment equity. We wanted kids, uh, no matter what, um, no matter what school they went to, they had the same basic package of equipment. So we developed a, an equipment pipeline. Um, so once the school site said they had a coach and a safe place to store um, the equipment, we brought their equipment to them and we had a, an onboarding meeting with them. And so that's in our school, no matter, or excuse me, in our district, no matter what school a kid attends, they have access to the same level of equipment that any, any other kid in the school district has. So we started with that. And then as we started to, um, to work through and, and visit uh, kids at their in their programs and also at our in-person events, we started to look around and we started to realize, um, not surprisingly, that it was very male dominated. So we said, ah, I know what we're going to do. Actually, it wasn't me who thought of that. It was Josh. He said, let's begin an all girls league to encourage female participation. And so this past year, um, we um, held our, as I mentioned earlier, held our first ever in-person all-girls Mario Kart tournament. And it was at the University of Redlands. 
and we had elementary involved for the first time. So there's equity that sort of vertical equity too, that you know the kids in elementary school are now getting the same type of experiences that middle and highs get. Um, and so at that tournament, we had it was it was incredible. So we again we bust in, uh, we did bus kids that, who needed it, but we had kids from. Uh, five, we have uh, five player teams from each of our schools. We had an elementary bracket, middle school bracket, and a high school bracket. And again, these students, girls this time, had never participated in anything like this, nor had their parents, especially at the elementary level, their parents were there. In fact, their parents were there before we even arrived because, you know, elementary parents, that's what they do. And <laughs> that's awesome. Something uh, like, oh my gosh, that's a great way to really hype an event, just invite elementary. Um, <laughs> But by the end of it, the conversations we were hearing just organically, I was walking around. It was a huge event. Hundreds of people came and it was kind of, we actually filled a, a, a multi-purpose room at a university. But the conversations between coach and students were something like this. Hey, I know you had a good time. I know we didn't win, but I hope you liked it. And even more so, I hope you joined the program. Meaning that these ki these girls weren't necessarily part of their school's esports program, but now they got a bit of a taste, and so hopefully they join. And so one of the things I'm going to do is rerun. Um, well, I'm going to run a new data set um, to see if our uh, goal was met. So we did. Uh, we ran some data. We flag our esports kids um, are in our student information system. And so we can track them for behavior, attendance, and grades, et cetera. And um, we know that we only had 20% female participation uh, up until that moment. And so I want to rerun it because in the real world of esports, females make up 45% of uh, gamers and also the ancillary, the things you see behind Claire, um, the esports professions are or 45. So we uh, knew we were lagging in that moment. So we were focusing on that. And then one last comment about the equity piece. Um, we try to do things slowly. So we don't say we're doing everything all at once, then do none of it. So we, since we focus on females, the next piece of this coming year is special education students. So we, um, fortunately, one of our esports coaches, um, who is also a special ed teacher, got a job in our district office as a special ed specialist. So we've added him to our team. Um, and so now when we're creating our next three-year charter, he's listening very carefully and adding things to make sure that we are building things for our special ed uh, populations. Um, okay, so I'll stop there and let you ask me anything else you want to know about. <laughs> the I think the special ed piece is really important and we see across the board great involvement and impact for students who are in that special ed population and then they join the esports club and they're just the same as everyone else and yep. they're so excited and um i mean we have so many examples we have a nasef scholastic fellow matt s iski that's down in san diego and has built out just phenomenal programs and i've been watching his videos pop up on linkedin of the students sharing their experience and it's wonderful we did a nasef um, competition why we play esports and one of the students who submitted a video talking about why he played talked about um, how he always had trouble making friends, but somehow he was able to do it through video games. And then once he did it through video games, he he was having other issues. And so they went to a specialist and he was diagnosed with autism. And he talked about how his esports community helped him through that and is helping him thrive now. I mean, these are just amazing um, impacts from esports. So equity, Julius, anything that you want to mention regarding how you address that in your district or in Sunshine State Esports League? Well, definitely, um, you know, uh, we come from a diverse school. Uh, we have a mixture of diverse kids in our, in our, in our community at our school. Um, the biggest thing is like uh, Peter talked about, you know, we, we noticed that we want to get more female participation this year. Um, and like I said before uh, earlier, that you know that's a big that's that's a big thing for us uh as far as you know our esports club growing um you know and once we started doing that and started you know looking and putting things out there for our 
young ladies to get involved in. Um, the biggest thing was our vice president and president are females. So the ones that actually running our whole entire club are, you know, female officers. And then um, when we put the podcast room together, um, our project team was all females, you know. So, you know, when you look at those things and you kind of, we took kind of like a small survey and said, hey, what do you guys want to be involved in? Um, and when we found out what they wanted to do, whether, you know, most, most of the, you know, want to do social media, want, some of them want to do broadcasting, some of them want to do sound engineer, things of that nature, you know, that growth is huge, um, not only for our students, but just for, you know, students, uh, you know, uh, outside of us, you know, uh, young ladies who, you know, maybe, you know, uh, coming from middle school, see that our school is doing this. And now we have students now trying to come in now. I uh, want to be part of the esports program. Um, the biggest thing too is language barriers um, are being broken. A lot of times, some of these kids are coming in where they, you know, um, they're not speaking English in you know proficient way. So when it comes down to a lot of this stuff too, is student to student con, uh, you know, communication uh, now are being broken down through esports, through scholastic esports, and that part is even you know even better because now these students can communicate. You know, even though they can't speak it verbally, they can communicate to each other on what they need to do. Or hey, you know, hey, I'm thinking about going here this weekend. You know, let's get together. Let's let's start something together. And those language barriers are being broken down through Scholastic Esports. And a lot of times, people, you when you don't think about it, but then you realize that once you see these students who are really trying their best to, you know, uh, uh, learn the language, um, you know, those barriers are being broken down. One of the biggest stories I have is we had a student. He speaks no English. Um, but he was able to communicate with his friends and now his friends are now they're getting together at the school and now are helping him through some of his reading literacy and things of that nature to help him get past some of these uh, 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 standardized tests that's actually going on. So those things, you see those things happening and that communication is through the Scholastic Esports. So that is huge. Hmm. That's awesome. Lori, do you have examples in your in your district and in your schools around equity and access? Yes. Um, well, you know, everyone brings up the, the word uh, communication and collaboration. Those are two of the most important words in esports. I always tell my students, my coaches, and even our colleges that are help us and mentor uh, that competition belongs on the stage. Otherwise, it's going to be communication and it's going to be collaboration. Only compete when you're on the stage. So, one of the things we did uh, when we first started was apply for a grant. So we can do the same thing, I think, that Peter and Julius talked about to get help. So it was an equ equitable situation and students did not have to pay the fees associated with being in the state finals, the state championships. And um, when we ran out of that money, we started getting money from other sources to continue that. Um, luckily, our provider, uh, got an affiliation with NASEF and now they've gone free. So Play Versus is not charging those. those. Thank you, NASEF, for that. Those uh, Now we can use that money for something else because there's always something you need. I think one of the biggest things that you find when you ask people, what is your biggest challenge? And people say, funding, funding, funding. And it's true, but it's all for the kids and um, we're going to continue helping in any way we can. Lori, you gave me an opportunity to use one of my favorite words in conjunction okay. with NASEF, which is free, 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 free. <laughs> yeah. And I think I say that every opportunity I have because that access is so important. And so we, um, if you're joining tournaments that are managed by NASEF, they're free. We run all kinds of challenges for students. In Minecraft, we have, um, I'm so excited about this year's Farmcraft Challenge. I can't even tell you. I've been getting sneak peeks of what this custom world that we've developed in Minecraft looks like this year, and it is fantastic. And so students are going to be going into Minecraft and learning all about agriculture and technology technology and things like aquaponics and hydroponics and I mean all of this high level stuff in the game of Minecraft through our Farmcraft program and guess how much it costs to join? Zero. And we also provide zero exactly thank you we also provide minecraft education edition if it's needed we're running a rube goldberg competition completely free to enter think about rube goldberg machine crazy contraption to accomplish a simple task and we have that competition running in minecraft right now we teamed up and ran that in unreal engine in the fall i mean all of these programs available free a, a venture valley game 
that teaches how to be an entrepreneur, completely free to play. And students can join and learn lessons about being entrepreneurs. I could go on and on, but I just want to make sure everyone knows like, that, you know, us as a nonprofit, we're doing everything we can to make these resources available free so that we can remove that barrier. Um, so absolutely one of my favorite things. So I am going to, we wanted to dive a little bit into the statistics because one thing I will say, we're talking about needing funding and people like the proof in the pudding, right? They like to see, okay, well, we're all saying how great this is, but how great is it actually? And so, um, um, I know Peter has mentioned that he has um, done some research. So we're going to go ahead and share. Um, let's see, we're just getting through the stream yard here. While we're working on that, Peter, do you want to go ahead and talk about um, that? I know we have the team that worked on this was sure. you and you'd mentioned Josh and Jessica. And yeah. then um, you want to tell us a little bit about the research and we'll get these slides up on the screen. Yes. And so what I want folks on this uh, call to understand is you're really sitting on a dormant volcano <laughs> of <laughs> student achievement. Um, what I'm about to show you is going to blow you away. And I want you to realize that these are your students too. You either already know it or you will uncover it. Um, so this isn't really Moreno Valley's student data. I think I would posit that this is esports, it's classic esports data for around the world. It's just a matter of, again, flagging your students, your esports student in your student information system, and then working on some data visualizations, either with some talented people on your team or finding them like we did at our county office of education. So again, I'm in California, Southern California, and um, I work in Riverside County. So I partnered with um, the Riverside County Office of Education, and they have a um, gentleman named Dr. Nick Chitwood there who uh, does these types of analyses and wanted to do so with us um, once he heard that I had some very primitive, uh, positive uh, uh, data analyses that I had done. He wanted to do that. Um, can you go back one slide? Um, so, yeah, so what he did is uh, we have about 1,800 kids in our esports program as of last year that we know about. And he, he was able to run uh, data on about a third of them, 627. And what he found was there was a significant positive relationship between participating in esports and school attendance, suspension rates, social emotional learning, and academics. So let's let's uh, dig into that a bit. Let's go to the next slide. So the first one, and this one is great for your superintendents who, and business folks who want to want to understand like, well, is this expensive? Is it, well, check this out. Kids who participated in esports out attended their non-participating peers by 7.34 more days. So that means they were in school seven more days for history, science, social studies, all that. And also what that means is our district was able to capture an additional $354,000 in average daily attendance funds. But remember, I told you in the previous slide, that was only uh, on a third of our kids. So if we extrapolate out to, extrapolate out to all 1,800, we've now captured about a million dollars of funds that we would not have all, uh, otherwise captured for our school district. And those monies are used for a district or to help students in, in the various ways um, that ADA helps uh, students in districts. So I wasn't satisfied with that uh, metric because I thought, well, maybe these kids were just good attenders of school, you know, nerds like me. Um, <laughs> um, I had um, Nick, Dr. Chipwood, go deeper. And so he, he did it. He did the modeling again, this time controlling for various demographics, including prior attendance rates. And still demonstrated that esports participants had a 19.3% lower absence rate than non participants. So, if you like, if in days, so that's 2,800 days, they were absent less, um, as visualized in that picture right there. And again, if you multiply by three, because remember, we're talking about 1,800 kids, not 600, we're about 8,500 extra days that kids were in school just last year. So, amazing. So, uh, let's go to the next slide. 
And okay, what about behavior? Well, you were 13% less likely uh, to be to be suspended. Um, and you were 81% more likely to have never been suspended in that particular year. Kids want to be in uh, this program and they are getting uh, coached on how to behave. Remember, gaming is super toxic in the in the outside world. So much so that it will make your hair curl if it's not curly already. The thing, the way that these kids trade in insults as just part of the, the daily life of a gamer, can't do that in an esports program. Um, and so you're less likely to get suspended because you're learning how a professional interacts. Uh, let's go to the next slide. So this slide, I'll go quickly, but basically on the on the on the right there, hey, esports kids were susp suspended less year over year, and non participants were suspended more year over year. In basketball, we call that a four point switch. So I won't explain that because um, it's kind of again sport nerdy, and we don't have time. But that is a good um, indication that something is is going well. This one is now here come the heartstrings. Um, when we first did our in uh, our first in-person tournament at March Mountain High School three years ago, um, we were pretty primitive back, th back then, But so I didn't have any data modeling done. But I did, at the end of the tournament, ask the kids, hey, just raise your hand. And this is a big auditorium, you know, filled with, you know, gobs of kids. And I said, how many of you for this, uh, for, for you, this was the first time you ever participated in anything outside of the school day? And I guessed that 60, about 60% of their hands went up. And so I was blown away by that. And it turns out that my estimation was pretty close, was very close, that I actually polled them because we wanted some qualitative data on SEO. I said, hey, um, is this the first time that you, and sure enough, the 60% of them said yes. And a lot of these kids are seniors in high school. So imagine if we catch, we're catching them now in elementary school. So they would have gone potentially, the data says, through their, their entire academic career, not doing anything for their school or out, outside of school. And now we're introducing it at, at, at the elementary level. So maybe, just maybe, we've changed them to where it's part of their life to participate in something outside of the school hours. So um, let's go to the next slide. So we kept uh, asking, I said, hey, which of these are better? And I backed off. It was just a blank question. I didn't lead them in any way. I said, uh, which of these do you feel is better since you joined esports? And I'll just let you study um, that particular slide. Um, that one is my favorite slide in the whole deck. Let's be real. That's amazing. Amazing. Yeah, and so now we went a bit further. So sure enough, if you participated in esports, um, your GPA was higher. Think about college scholarships um, and or your college going mindset if your GPA is higher. Um, okay, let's go to the next slide. Didn't stop there. This is our, in California, we use uh, the SBAC exam for our CASP, our end of the year summative exam. And look what kids did um, on those growth targets. The dotted line represents how much they should have grown year over year. The red are the kids who participated in esports. And look what they did compared to non-participating kids. Struggled a little bit in eighth grade, but look what happened in math. Woo. Uh, I don't yeah. know about the school district, but here in Moreno Valley, our kids struggle in math. But awesome, look baby. what awesome. they did in eighth grade. At I mean, I'm, that one I just couldn't believe. They are blowing through growth targets. That's amazing. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. Peter, thank you so much for sharing this with us. We are getting dangerously close to the top of the hour. So um, I wanted to just give us a couple minutes to wrap up. But hopefully everybody watching this is seeing, I mean, we are not just talking about impacts. We have documented impacts. We have anecdotal impacts. I mean, you can see the enthusiasm from every one of us here. And I know it's it's mirrored in every one of you watching this. And so if you're trying to figure out how do I get connected? How do I leverage all of this? I own a business. How do I mentor some of these students? How do I connect with my local esports program at my school? I mean, there are hopefully loads of questions that have come up from this conversation and we would love to help you answer them. Um, you can always reach us via email, info at nasef.org. We also have tons of free resources, free, free, free resources on our website. And um, if you join NASEF, which is <clears throat> free, 
Uh, once you do that, you'll be able to access the dashboard. And we've recently added a book that Peter wrote about helping to start esports at a district level. So that's available on our website, as well as many other toolkits and um, programs to help get you going. So really, if there's anything that any of us can do to support you, to assist, please let us know. Um, and thank you so much to the Esports Trade Association for allowing us to shine a light on what is happening in the Scholastic world because it is phenomenal. The uh, link is here for you to join the Esports Trade Association as a member. Tons of benefits in the Esports Trade Association. And I know we have an exciting conference coming up this summer. So if you can make plans to join us in Chicago, we have the Esports Next conference presented by Coca-Cola in early July, and there are discounts available for members. So you can go to <laughs> esportsnext.gg to sign up and join us there. So um, if you have any questions on this, let us know. And otherwise, hopefully we'll see some of you on the Virtual Coffee Connections event. There is no shortage of ways to connect with your peers in the esports world. So thank you to the Esports Trade Association for that. Lori, Peter, Julius, you all are doing fantastic work. We really appreciate it. Um, so until next time, thank you all for joining. Thank you all. Thank you.